Welcome back, friends. So this time we're going to talk about something very, very exciting. I think probably what most people are trying to do, their eventual goal, which is improvising fugues. And this is um, sort of a, a hot topic, I think. Definitely a lot of my own students come to me saying this is what they'd like to do. Um, so there's good news and bad news. Bad news is it's sometimes as hard as it sounds. The good news is, is that it's very, very possible. And with plenty of practice and um, some luck, you can absolutely learn to improvise fugues just as well as everyone else. It's just about, like everything else, the, the hours that you put in. So I'm mostly for this video going to be improvising very simple expositions since this is meant to be an introduction and I couldn't possibly teach you everything about it in 30 minutes. Um, I probably couldn't teach you everything about it in four or five hours. Um, so things are going to be kept relatively simple. Um, if you'd like some examples of some more involved fugues, there are other videos um, of me improvising elsewhere on the channel that you can look for. But for today, uh, my goal is to just get you started and um, hopefully uh, hopefully allow allow you to see sort of the path that, that one would have to take um, to get to um, more complex fugues. All right, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's hop in. All right, so one does not simply improvise a fugue, unfortunately. Um, there are a few prerequisites that we should get out of the way really quick. The first one is one should have a very strong background in basso continuo. With my own students who want to improvise fugues, I, I probably spend the majority of the lesson actually doing exercises in basso continuo. We work on a lot of Corelli together um, and other things, um, and it's just so, so useful. Not only because it it familiarizes you in a really natural way over the course of studying it with, with the Baroque style, um, but also because it translates into the very useful specific ability for fugue improv, which is uh, being able to put something in your left hand and harmonize it in your right. Uh, by studying Partimento specifically, you also gain a taste of, of good structure in improv, uh, or at least possible microstructures uh, in improv, um, good habits for your hands, um, certain Partimenti you know, work on one sequence exclusively or one cadence or something like that. And so all of these things that are healthy for good Baroque improvisation in general are also healthy for fugue improv. Specifically with Basso Continuo, um, somebody who's quite good at it and then, for example, can read um, uh, a high Baroque piece that is figured, but without the figures, you know, for example, reading something like Handel or Bach without figures, um, that, uh, that kind of ability is really useful because then you can sort of put any subject in your left hand and know what to do with your right. Similarly, uh, it's useful if you can harmonize melodies. So if I give you a melody and um, tell you to put it in your right hand, you should be able to um, put some appropriate chords in your left hand, or at least identify different harmonic possibilities for a given melody. It should go without saying that um, you should have a strong familiarity with the style that you want to improvise in. In this case, I would say Baroque music specifically because so many fugues come from that era and our idea of a good fugue um, was born at the end of that era. So uh, the more comfortable you are in this language, of course, the easier your life gets. And the fourth thing, which is often neglected, but which I, I would really strongly advocate for, is that you should really have composed a lot of fugues. You should do this both at and away from the keyboard. But dealing with these problems that arise when you're trying to really write in earnest a Baroque fugue and, and, have it, ha, and have it be of a high quality, the same problems arise in improvisation. And, and you can use some shortcuts that you've devised, or you can simplify some of your solutions. Um, but, but really, uh, honestly, from experience, um, I mean, you, know, you, you, you wrestle with these things you know, dozens of times. Um, and it just sort of gets you thinking in a way that's conducive to making progress um, in improvising fugues. I mean, it, it, it's. Uh, it's very similar to number three, right? I mean, if you have a strong familiarity with, with the style, then of course, you know, you can, you can improvise um, in it with, with a lot more ease. So, you know, if, if these four things don't necessarily apply to you, uh, don't worry. I mean, the, the whole purpose of this channel is to get you up to speed. Um, so, uh, like I said, I really would hope to make this video just one in a series, and we can deal with both topics more and, and less advanced 
um, that have to do specifically with fugue improvisation. And hopefully all of the other videos that aren't explicitly about fugue improvisation will be helpful um, to getting you up to speed with, with these prerequisites. All right, so now let's try to actually improvise our first fugue. All right, so you've read dozens and dozens of books of Partimenti, and you've played with your Baroque ensemble for 10 years now, and you're used to interluding at the church that you work at, etc., etc. Uh, and now you're ready to improvise your first fugue. So what are the first things that we should consider when we're sitting down to improvise a fugue? Well, the first thing we're going to have to play is, of course, the exposition, which includes um, the entry of the voices. Frankly, I think this is the hardest part of improvising a fugue is each voice entering separately. And in order to do that, we need to know this. We need to know basically how to harmonize a melody in two, three, and four voices. Or more, if uh, you're that kind of masochist. Um, and uh, we need to be able to do it in both the right and left hand. just like we said before. Uh, let's not worry for now about voices in, in middle, um, or rather entries in, in middle voices. Um, I think actually I can make a short separate video about how to practice this. It, it's not that it's impossibly difficult, it's just um, it's something we can get away without doing for now. So uh, it's an added complication that we, that we don't need to discuss. Um, okay, so if we can do that, if we can harmonize a certain subject in, in two, three, and four voices in the right hand and left hand, then it's just a matter of, of putting them together um, in a certain order, right? So the subject is stated in, in the first voice, in some key, um, and then we have, you know, the answer. This is two voices, of course, and there's some counter subject going on here. And this is usually in five, this is usually in one. Um, and then we have another subject, say over here. Um, in uh, an improvised fugue, you know, um, counter subject, it's, it's a whole, it's, again, it's a, I could make a video about it, but you know, we, we, don't, we don't really need to put the same thing there. We can just put something else, you know, and then perhaps there's another entry in, in, the, in the base. Stands for subject, so there you go. Right, so if we can harmonize the subject, yeah, this would be an answer, I guess. But let's just do it like that. Um, if we can harmonize the subject in one voice, two voices, three voices, and four voices, everything going on here, um, then it's just a matter of putting these things together. Not, not to sound like a broken record, but just to be explicit, explicit about it. Okay, so what are some exercises that we can do um, to, to get good at that? Well, um, do just this. But what kind of subjects should we work with? Um, I think explicitly, honestly, we should probably be working with skeletal subjects at first. And by this I mean, um, you know, I mean, actually, I practice by using a pretty extreme version. I'll, I'll just do things like that and then put that, you know, in three voices, two voices, four voices, I'll put it in the soprano and the bass and the alto and the tenor and all of that, you know, so I'll, I'll do something like You know, and then I'll, I'll stick this little bit um, down there or in there, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I'll try to come up with a bunch of different harmonizations. Um, but we can work with, you know, subjects that are slightly more musical than that. One that we're going to work with in a second is this guy. But you probably shouldn't be working with subjects that are too much more complicated than that, uh, or or rhythmically, you know, that that quick. Um, because you can always just decorate these things later once you're really familiar with them. Uh, and then that's a really, really good way um, to just sort of quickly add complexity without doing much, uh, without much extra effort. So let me show you an example of, of just a few ways to practice a subject. And I'm just going to do this in a skitter scatter way for now. So I'm just going to do it in, you know, three voices or four or two or whatever, and a, in a couple different keys and then a couple different voices and a few different harmonizations. But 
I do recommend more directed practice, um, uh, not this smorgasbord. Um, you know, so for example, you know, do exclusively, you know, two voices and, and alternate um, uh, between your right hand and left hand, or do exclusively three and work with one harmonization at a time, etc. But this is just a sort of smorgasbord of the possibilities. Okay, so let's say that we can now harmonize uh, a given subject in two, three, and four voices, and we can do it uh, in the top voice or the bottom voice in a bunch of different keys. So now, um, what what order should we actually put this in? There are a bunch of ways to do that, and uh, you know, how do we actually build this exposition? And aren't there things called tonal and real answers? So let's let's tackle all those things head on now. Um, so first, let's worry about what order should the voices enter in. Um, there are a million ways to do this, but there's only a few very good ways and a few very bad ways. Very bad ways. So uh, by this I mean uh, it's both easy. So if it's very good, it's both easy and uh, sounds good. Uh, and by very bad ways, I mean it's hard and sounds bad. So for now, um, for now, let's just pretend that easy means uh, no entries in the middle voice. Again, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of good ways to do this, uh, and it's possible, but requires extra practice, so let's just not worry about it now. And by sound good, I mean it, it winds up when all the voices enter, they, they, they um, start and or end, um, you know, on, on tones that um, make a nice spacing. So for example, you know, in the ideal world, we would like for things to, um, you know, resemble the overtone series, so, so something like this. You know, so your so your your voices should be spaced somewhat like this in the entry. You know, maybe these can represent uh, you know sort of general areas of the start note of the subject or sort of where they end up um, at the cadence. Uh, you know, of things. Um, basically, your voices should hover around these. You know, and there are there are other shapes that are good. You know, we also sometimes like them uh, close together like that maybe. Um, but but what we don't like is when things are sort of bottom heavy. You know, like this, uh, and we don't like it when they're uh, too far apart like that. So. We just we don't want to get into a situation where you know we've we've entered uh, we've entered all of our voices and then our hands kind of look something like this. So how do we accomplish uh, a shape like this, and and how can we sort of guarantee that um, you know where our voices enter uh, is going to produce um, this desirable sort of hand pattern? Uh, and, and by the way, let me just mention really quickly, you know these, these kind of this kind of resembles, um, or rather, these are sometimes called closed and open positions. Uh, Handel talks about this in his Intimio Treatise. Um, and I've gone over the, I've gone over this in uh, one of my first videos. Open essentially just means uh, two notes in each hand. Um, uh, and uh, closed means sort of three in your right hand and, and one in your left. Okay, so how do we accomplish these shapes um, by entries? Okay, so let's pretend that our subject, like the one that um, we were just sort of brainstorming on before, um, begins on scale degree uh, five and, and goes to three, something like that. In that case, it'll have a tonal answer that's eight to seven, so that's depicted over here. Um, and each note that I have over here represents where it would enter 
So right, if I have um, a subject that starts 5.3 and then is answered 8.7, here would be a subject, here would be an answer, here would be a subject, here would be an answer. Makes sense. So this, this will also work um, this will also work if my answer is is uh, in four, right? So if it's if it's a it's a it's a real answer at the fourth, this will also work um, for the purposes of talking about um, where things should enter. So notice what I've I've done here. I've basically just written out the first note of each entry and then figured out where they end up. Now they might not end here, right? But they're going to maintain the general area that they start in. So this is a pretty good shape if you just go right up or right down. If you start with the bass and you go up, or you start with the soprano and you go down, um, this is a pretty good way if you're imitating at uh, the fourth or fifth, which of course you always are in a broke group. Um, it's a good way to end up with a pretty natural shape. You can do this a bunch of other ways too. Uh, you can do this by often starting with a middle voice, the, the tenor or the alto, which is a lot nicer. You get this sort of alternation since this is above and that's below and then that's finally above. It's best if you get these extremes last. So if you can have something that ends in BS or SB, um, these are particularly nice orderings. Um, here's one that's not so good. Um, this guy results in something that I was sort of talking about up there where um, the spacing is just a little bit too far. There's, a, there's an octave in between the tenor and the alto, which is just a bit too much. Um, this is totally usable. It's just an example of something that's less good. Um, and here's an example of something that's particularly good. So we have uh, this ordering here, ATBS. This results in a particularly close spacing. Um, so it's even closer, actually, than this one. This is an octave and a fourth, and this is an octave and a fifth. So these are a few shapes to get you started. And, and, and as a last uh, thing to say, just note that there's only a few different um, I call them shapes because you can categorize them in a few different ways. There's basically the one that alternates like this. There's uh, either it goes up and then down or vice versa, right? And this maybe this guy could be last, so it could have, of course, just gone like that just as easily. Um, here's one that's related. Uh-oh, what did I do? The eraser. That's related. Same with that guy. Uh, or they can go, all, you know, just all in one direction, like the one that we discussed at first. So um, I'm going to play now a, a decorated version of, um, of the subject that we were just brainstorming with, and I'm going to do just a couple different entry patterns. So let's talk really quickly about uh, real versus tonal answers. So um, without going into a, a theory lesson about this, I'm, go I'm going to assume that you, you mostly know what the difference is. Um, just really, really quickly, uh, a real answer is, is when the subject is, is um, just transposed without changing the, the intervallic content of it. two, four, or five. Um, a tonal answer is when, um, well, it's when the subject's shape is kept the same, and that's very important. Um, but, uh, but the intervals are, are deformed in such a way that, uh, well, it, I mean, like whole books are written about this. Um, and in fact, I, I, I encourage you, I've referenced this in another one. Uh, Andre Gidalge wrote a tome about this. Um, 
about all the nitty gritty of this, but uh, basically the intervals are deformed in a tonal answer in such a way, essentially, that sort of 5-1 motions become 1-5 motions and vice versa. Okay, so uh, just as an example, if this is my subject in F major, right, a real answer would just be this guy. Um, but because this is uh, this is sort of a five to one motion, right, this now has to become a one to five motion. So scale degree five becomes scale degree one, uh, and then this remains three in the new key. So this is this bit now. Um, this is now a one to five motion. And then now we're in the new key here. And, and, and all of the theoretical underpinnings of this are, are explained in, in this book and many, many others. Um, let's just, for our purposes, right, we, we care about these things um, because they, they offer certain advantages and disadvantages um, when we're improvising fugue. So let's talk about those. Why should we use a real versus tonal answer um, when we're improvising? So uh, the benefits of a real answer, essentially, I think, I mean, you know, um, we could talk about this at length, but just, but just to touch on a few important aspects of this discussion, I think the real advantage of, of a real answer is that there's a tail. It's also the, the disadvantage. So um, a real answer usually must include a, a transition of some kind, which I'm going to call a tail. And that leads us into um, the new key. So uh, for example, you know, if I'm in C major, let's just use that subject that we've been kind of working with. I might, uh, and this was answered tonally in, in my uh, first example, created it in F, but if I wanted to make this a, a, a real answer, I might include something like this. Yum pum dum bum ya da 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 dum. And now I can answer this just directly without changing anything. Right, this is this is a G and now this is a D. Now in a tonal answer, I actually don't need that tail as as we saw. Or I guess maybe you didn't see, but you're about to see when I actually um uh, improvise a a full fugue on that on that thing that we were brainstorming on earlier, the subject over here, which I, which I will do right after this for you. Um, but uh, you'll see that the advantage of a tonal answer is essentially that um, I don't need a tail because um, the the tonal answer is if if uh, if my motion is some sort of f uh, five one motion, which it almost always is, if if the subject um, starts on scale degree five, um, then the fact that it has to be a one five motion means that I can stay in the tonic um, for at least the first bit of my answer. So it becomes this. And you know, if I wanted, I, I didn't have to modulate really until there. You know, sometimes I do it over here, create a, a little G over there. But when, whenever I introduce this sharp four, you know, now I'm sort of in the new key, but I don't really have to do it until until over here in a, in a tonal answer. So that's really nice because I don't need this this tail. I can just sort of build entries upon themselves. Um, therefore, you know, when I'm improvising, I can just kind of just put the subject, you know, again and again in, in different places, you know, in, in different keys. Um, but the caveat is that, you know, this requires a knowledge of how to deform your subject. And, and you'll have to know, for example, that, you know, uh, scale degree five, scale degree three turns into scale degree eight, scale degree seven. And you'll have to sort of know all these things. They're not as complicated as these tones make them sound in practice, um, but it still does, you know, require some hands-on experience. So um, by not needing a tail, you know, one needs to know how to exploit this property aware of how 
common subject interval motions. Uh, more specifically, at, at the head of the subject. Because at a certain point, we're in the new key, and, and the intervals aren't, aren't deformed anymore. Um, uh, we need to be aware of how common uh, subject interval motions are deformed. So now when we do have a tail, um, you know, there's, there's a downside to this too, because now we have to know how to transpose this tail back um, it, when we have to get back from uh, 5 back to 1. So how do I turn this, you know, into a transition that goes to um, back to C, for example? So this takes us to G, but how do I make us, you know, take this back to um, C? Because if I just do this same thing in 5, this will take us all the way to D major, which is not what we want. Oops. Right? We don't, we don't want that. We don't need that. Well, you know, I mean, the beauty here is that, like, you know, this tail, you can just kind of say, well, it's not really part of the subject, it's just kind of a tail. So um, in, a, in an ideal world, you know, we try to keep the shape sort of similar. Um, you know, we, could, we could be direct about it like this. There's this little skip step that happens here, which isn't great, but, uh, you know, we, we could just as easily do something like this. And now we're back in C, by the way, this went to D. So this goes to C. So basically we're, we're more liberal with the shape when we have um, a tail that we can play with. And we can kind of do whatever we want, you know, instead. And we can just sort of transition a different way and it's not going to interrupt it. Um, meanwhile, if we try to enter, for example, here, you know, on D, we're just gonna create some sort of dissonance. Um, so we can't just directly, you know, stick things in a new key without having modulated, of course. Um, now, there are a few tricks to this effect that I can just um, give you right, right away. Uh, really, they're not, I, I should call them sort of rules of thumb. I'm just going to put these at the bottom of here, at uh, the bottom here. I, I really recommend um, working with, with subjects that go uh, from scale degree 5 to 3, or scale degree 1 to 2. First of all, probably 95% of all subjects fall into one of those two categories. Uh, and the ones that, that don't are usually sort of um, reducible to, to one of those two categories in some sense anyway. Um, so subjects that start with and the reason is um, I can practice both tonal and real answers with, with both of these. Um, Specifically with things that go from scale degree 5 to 3. Let's do this in F major. This is answered tonally over here. So if my subject, you know, ends, some, some, if it starts on, on C and ends on F or A, which it almost all the time does if I'm starting on scale degree 5 in F major, right, then I'm already in this key. This is the advantage we talked about of the, of the tonal answer. Uh, and this is uh, really nice because you can have things, you know, you usually uh, have a, a counter subject that looks something like, uh, you know, something like this, something of sort of this type where the, um, where the tonic, uh, or rather the fifth is, uh, you know, suspended and uh, over the, over the raised fourth. And this is a very, very common counter subject that you'll see all the time that, um, that I'm about to use in the example that I'm going to show you. And, and uh, this, op this type of opening um, is really conducive to it. Uh, with 1 to 2, with scale degrees 1 and 2, if something starts like this and ends, of course, on A or F, which it usually does, then this new thing is the, is the scale, deg is scale degree 5, so sort of both a real and a tonal answer. Um, so here I'm ending on F of some kind. Uh, and then the transition to, um, to 5 is easy via this, right? I can, I can make this predominant. I can stick uh, the raised fourth under it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these things are a good start. Um, a word of caution, if your fugue subject features prominently 5, 4, 3, and not 3, like the decoration I did, you, you might have noticed that I answered it totally different when I did the decoration um, than, than I did the first time when I was just kind of brainstorming. If your subject goes like this, you can't actually answer that tonally because then your subject becomes that. 
and and um, ya da dum, you know, ya da dum. Those are to two totally different shapes. Um, so you can't really do that. This repeated note figure is sort of not allowed. Now, if your subject does something like that, then you probably could get away with it. And I'll show this to you in an example too, um, because then this is kind of a new thing on its own. So this that could feasibly become something like this. By the way, the way to solve this problem uh, is to simply answer it, uh, re um, simply give it a real answer at the fourth, which is what I did uh, in, in the previous uh, examples in D major and F major, I think. All right, so now I'm just going to play for you a, a few examples uh, of these subject headers that I, I said were particularly easy. Um, I'll play for you the, um, the one to two motion and the five to three motion that we've been sort of working with. Um, and then I'll show you this, uh, this, this exception to the, to the five, four sort of rule of thumb that I was just talking about, um, with that dotted figure in the, in the bottom right. And then we can uh, wrap it up by talking about some, um, some directions for practice and, and what we can talk about in future videos and, and how to actually put a few together past the exposition. So where do we go from here? Well, we sort of uh, just got a little taste of how we might put together a, a, an improvised fugal exposition. We've at least gotten to the point where all the voices enter. Um, so for, for a good, um, more general treatment on what to do after that, um, I, I'm going to refer you to the last video that I made, um, which was on um, basic Baroque improvisation structures. But just briefly, since we already know how to do what, what we can do, um, for your very, very first improvised full fugue, past the exposition, we can kind of just take the lessons that we learned and, and apply them differently. So here's um, one possible formula for, um, you know, for baby's first fugue. So an exposition where the voices enter in, you know, some nice way. Then there's some cadence. Perhaps you insert a sequence here in the tonic. Or the dominant if you don't want to enter um, the uh, fifth, uh, if you don't want to uh, have a fifth entry. Um, and that doesn't have to be in a new voice, by the way. It could just be a fifth entry in an, an old voice to reestablish the tonic, right? Because in four voices, we would get one, five, one, five, or one, four, one, four. Uh, in any case, all the voices enter, and then there's some type of ribbon that's wrapped around it. Then there's just a little transition, just a little bar or two. Um, and then we do the same, the same thing in, in, uh, in a related key. So, little transition. Uh, 
Uh, often this related key is the relative major or minor. And then at the end, it's just a recap. And the recap can be all the voices entering again, exactly the same as the exposition. Or it can just maybe be uh, just a couple entries with all the voices already having entered. Uh, either way, we're back in the tonic. This is some other key, and we're back in the tonic again. And this is a really easy, um, easy to remember thing because you don't actually have to do more than know how to enter your voices or um, keep the texture just kind of going by, by entering again in the, in the soprano or the bass once you've established all the voices. So that was just a really simple, um, uh, a really simple uh, demonstration of, of an improvised fugue using those, um, uh, that really basic roadmap that I put out before you. And uh, I, I kept it simple also so that hopefully some of the things we've discussed over the course of this video would, would be pretty clearly represented. Um, where to go from here? You know, if, if, uh, if, if the contents of, of this video sort of um, bore you or, or bore you in the future, um, here are some some things that we can do together in the future. And perhaps you all can tell me uh, which, which of these jump out at you, or maybe you'll say, you know, uh, Nicole, all of this is too much. Um, you know, can we please just have another video on, on harmony boxing? And I'm of course more than happy to do that too. So the first thing I wrote up here is middle voice entries, not because it's, it's um, the most important, you know, uh, or, or anything like that, but just because it's probably the easiest thing to just insert uh, to what we already know. Um, we can add them in the exposition or, or elsewhere um, using sort of the, the same uh, the same techniques uh, that we discussed earlier, and there are a couple ways to do that, which I can talk about later. Now, the next thing I wrote down is invertible counterpoint, uh, by which I mean, you know, when when you craft these exercises for yourself, you're really making your life easier. If, for example, um, whatever you put, let, let's say you're harmonizing something in in um, in the soprano, uh, and uh, and I write. Um, you know, I, I write three other voices that are an invertible counterpoint. Well, at that point, I can just kind of permute them however I wish. So I can I can turn S A T B and I can I can move these and mix these all around however I want. You know, I can turn it into that, etc. And all of the voices will still work out, and the harmonies will still be pretty clear. Usually, um, usually I keep the bass relatively constant, and then I just kind of permute the upper ones. You know, so I'll do something like. Uh, like this, you know. That way, the the harmonies are all the same, but these can move around however they want. Um, and when you when you do that, then you really only have to remember sort of you know uh, a few different harmonizations of of your subject, and and you'll know sort of what you know. For example, you can vary your top voice to be either the subject or one of these other 
little counter subjects and you'll kind of know where to put it in, in the other voices. So having invertible counterpoint is, is always very, very useful um, because you can permute these voices around and, and if your counter subjects are interesting enough, then you know you can use them as, as straight up new material and you won't be having to reharmonize things. Um, speaking of which, uh, we could t spend a whole lot of time also on counter subjects in general, whether they should be uh, consistent or not. Uh, the answer is probably no, um, unless again you're that kind of masochist. Um, and and you know, in general, how do we treat material that's not the not the fugue subject? What do we do with it? How is it generated? How can we introduce it? Um, uh, what what can um, how can we use it to our advantage? Can we create textures from it? H um, you know, do we how much do we have to plan about how much it it fits with the subject, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, there's a whole lot to talk about about how to deal with material in the fugue that that isn't the explicit subject. Um, related, uh, of course, to that is what what you actually do in the in the, in the development. What devices are available to you? Um, how do you vary these these different textures? Um, what are some more general structures in a fugue, not just that sort of you know baby formula that that we um, that we used uh, just a minute ago? Um, how can I understand these more generally? Um, and, uh, and of course, then within that are stretti and prolation. Uh, there's this really advanced technique called stretto fuga that many of you may have heard about, um, which is basically a set of rules that, that can tell you whether or not your subject will work um, in canon at this interval or that interval or at this time uh, interval or, or that time interval. Um, and these are useful things to know about when you're improvising because it can sound really impressive if you on the fly just kind of create a canon at the very end. Um, but it also might sound a bit contrived, so you know you have to use these things sparingly. The last thing I wrote down here is prolation, um, just because I thought of it, not because it's a, a real topic that somebody should practice in improvising fugues. Um, if you really want to be able to, um, you know, given a subject from the audience, put it in, you know, diminution and augmentation, uh, good luck. Um, not any subject is going to just work with that, and. Uh, and it would basically work with this. I think would just basically amount to memorizing a bunch of subjects that do, and then, well, I don't know. It's a good thing to know about for for composition, but um, but not something I think about too often when I'm improvising. So that's it for now. I really hope that um, someday I can make a, a sort of series of videos about this because we could probably talk about it for quite a while, and there are a lot of topics to cover. Uh, more in depth. So I, I do hope to do that later. For now, at least, I hope I've left you with um, a roadmap for improvement um, and some exercises you can do, and, and hopefully a knowledge of, of what holes you might have to fill um, before you can really tackle this head on. All right, thanks so much for watching. See you next time.